Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our program, Buzzing with Spongy Moth. Before we get started, I want to introduce myself. My name is Bob Bruner, and I am the exotic forest pest educator with the Department of Entomology at Purdue University. Today, we're going to be talking about spongy moth. This insect is present in our state, unfortunately, primarily to the northern portions of it, and we do expect it to spread. So today, I wanted to give you some information on how to identify it and what to do when you find it. This insect has a little bit of a history, and I want to go over that first to keep everybody on the same page. So first off, you probably know this insect by a different name, and I'm only going to use it once, the gypsy moth. That term, unfortunately, has a history to it, and as a part of the Better Common Names Project, entomologists in our country have been working on changing certain common names of insects that contain derogatory or pejorative terminology. We want to break down barriers to help educate more and more people, and using terms like that just doesn't work. So from now on, this insect will be referred to as the spongy moth, and there is a reason for that particular name that I'm going to go over in a little bit. Now, how was spongy moth originally introduced into our country? Like many insects that we deal with now, unfortunately, it was actually intentionally brought here. So back in 1869, a gentleman named Etienne Leopold Trevolo, a lithographer and an amateur entomologist, wanted to breed spongy moth to try to create some kind of hybridized silk moth that was able to survive and be used here in North America. Originally, spongy moth was native to Europe and Asia, so he brought over breeding stock. Now, unfortunately, he was only an amateur entomologist, so escapes were inevitable, and it did get out. It was able to establish itself into portions of what would become modern New England, and it was quarantined in those locations in the early 1900s due to the severity of the original infestations. Those quarantines were largely successful for a very long time, but unfortunately, the movement of this insect was going to happen no matter what we did, and it has since spread to different states in the United States. So first off, let's get on the same page with what we're looking at. What is a spongy moth? So this is a species of moth that currently belongs to a family of moths named Erevidae, but it has actually been classified as a few different things. Um, one that some of you may recognize is a group of moths named Noctuity, which is a very, very large group of them. Um, however, it's bounced around a few different classifications. Now, just like other moths and butterfly species, this insect is going to have a life cycle with complete metamorphosis, meaning it's going to go through egg, caterpillar, pupa, and adult stages. And the primary stage that we are concerned about when it comes to when it's doing damage is going to be the caterpillar. The adults are non-feeding. They only live to reproduce, and then they'll die shortly after. Unfortunately, this particular invasive species is a great representation of why invasive species are bad. It can attack several different kinds of host plants and be successful on them. Here in Indiana, we will see them be the most successful or the most voracious on oak, but it can go to several species of trees. Now, what we're looking at now is a spongy moth adult. This can be a fairly drab moth, though right now the female that you're looking at does have some markings on it that do set it apart from other insects. Now, the uh, females and males are going to be sexually dimorphic in that they're going to be different sizes and different colors. So females are going to be larger, about an inch and a half, and they're going to have those creamy pale wings with a V-shaped mark on them. Males are going to be smaller, darker, with more mottled brown and gray, and they're going to have very feathery antenna that will stand out to you as a feature. And again, the adults are non-feeding. They can't do any damage to any plants. They're only going to survive long enough to find a mate and reproduce. Now, spongy moth larvae are the easier part. These can be readily identified, at least in the later larval stages. So these are the damaging portions of this insect's life cycle. What they do is they have chewing mouth parts that they can use to completely defoliate trees. The early instars, meaning the early growth stages of this caterpillar, are going to be modeled. They're not going to stand out very much, though they will have that same fringe of hair that you saw in the last image. Eventually, they're going to develop these red and blue bumps that are going to make them very, very easily identifiable. 
They'll also have a tendency to move up and down the trunk of a tree at regular intervals to avoid predators and to manage the heat of the day. And that's actually gonna offer us some control measures that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Now the egg mass. The egg mass is where the spongy moth gets its name. So unlike a lot of caterpillar species, spongy moth caterpillars do not actually produce silk as they move around. A lot of, a lot of other species will. They'll have it lining trees and you can identify it very easily. The adults, however, will produce a kind of silk material that they'll use to cover their egg masses. And this is where we get that name. That spongy egg mass is going to be attached to the side of a tree, and it's going to have that protective covering over it so it can overwinter on those trees for about eight to nine months. So you're going to start looking for those egg masses from September to April, depending on how warm it is where you are. So a little on the life cycle of this insect, it is a fairly traditional life cycle in terms of what moths will do. So what we are looking at here is that we're going to start finding egg masses from late September all the way through March. And then in April, our first instar larvae are going to start appearing and hatching out. And they're going to develop from April all the way through to the end of June. In July, they're going to form a cocoon like you see there in that picture, probably lasting for about two, maybe even three weeks, if, depending on temperature and moisture, and eventually hatching out into their adult forms in August where they'll reproduce and eventually die. So I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit here, but things to note. So the larva, when they hatch, they will go through five to six instars. Now males don't need as much energy as the females, so they'll only go through five, meaning they're going to molt or shed their exoskeleton five times. Females, however, need more energy so they can actually be able to develop eggs. So they're going to go through that sixth instar, that sixth shedding, or that period in between shedding, so that way they can store up energy and be able to reproduce successfully. That pupation is going to start in late June, early July, and the adults, of course, are going to hatch out in August and persist through September. They will not survive the cold, though. They don't have any energy left after that. So let's talk a little bit about the damage that these insects do. Now, the trouble here is that the damage is very, very easily explained. They just defoliate trees. They eat all the leaves off of them. And the image you see in front of you right now is a great example of the kind of damage that they can do. So the spongy moth can consume and be successful on several types of trees. And I'm going to show you a listing of those trees momentarily. In Indiana, it's going to prefer oak. And one thing to keep in mind is that while the caterpillars can completely defoliate a tree, most of those trees will survive to the next season. The big problem occurs is that as that damage keeps happening again and again, maybe say over two, three seasons, the tree's overall health is going to be reduced significantly. And the constant damage is going to leave openings for disease to come in and eventually kill the tree. So even though spongy moth itself may not directly kill most trees, they're going to be the inevitable murderer, so to speak. So they're going to create a situation where the tree is just simply not going to survive. This is why they're so damaging. So some of the trees that we need to watch out for here in Indiana, this is actually taken from a publication by Cliff Sadoff from the Department of Entomology at Purdue. You can see that there are several trees on here and they're listed from most preferred to least preferred. Now, most animals and organisms are going to start with their most preferred host and then move through the ones that they prefer less as they begin to populate and they're just too, their numbers are too intense on their preferred host. They gotta move down and find something like the next best thing. Now you can see here, we've got hawthorn, hazelnut, oaks, poplar, a lot of trees that we have here in Indiana in abundance. Those are gonna be our most preferred. Even in our somewhat preferred trees, you can see some spots where there are gonna be issues. One of them that pops out to me looking at this is black walnut. If that's a somewhat preferred host of spongy moth, it's important to keep that in mind because it is going to be very preferred also by spotted lanternfly. So you may be looking at a situation, depending on where you are in Indiana, where you now have two invasive species attacking the same type of tree. That is not a good situation to be in. Um, we also see on here cherry, hemlock, hickory, all sorts of things, maples are appearing. Um, that is a large breadth of trees. Now the least preferred, we're actually moving more into evergreens, which they are not going to want as much because those evergreens are gonna to be tougher to eat and tougher to digest. 
Um, thankfully, the least dogwood is at least on least preferred. It's one of my favorite trees. I, I have dogwoods in my yard, but we can see tulip tree poplar, arborvitae, all sorts of things that are very regularly planted here in Indiana. So this kind of illustrates a picture for you of how many trees could be at risk if this insect really starts to spread across the state. Now, one of the important things that we need to keep in mind when it comes to spongy moth, spongy moth is already established in our state. It will not be possible to eradicate it. What we need to do is slow its spread to try to bring it into a controllable state. And that is what Purdue University and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources are working together to try to do. And the program you're listening to right now is one of those efforts. You're listening to this, you're learning how to identify it, and you can help us report it. Now, some of the good things that go with this. We focus on isolated infestations that appear outside of the primary infestation areas. We only have so many counties in Indiana that are infested, and we're focusing on making sure the spread doesn't go beyond that. Female spongy moths are incapable of flight. This is good. That means that they cannot spread that quickly, but it is important to keep in mind that according to uh, Vince Burkle from the DNR, I just got to learn this myself recently, that when spongy moth larvae completely defoliate a tree, they will move to a new tree, which means they're going to cross a good distance on their own. That's a high risk moment for those insects because that means they're going to be at risk for birds, but they're successful enough at it that it actually helps to spread them. They'll also get blown by the wind from tree to tree, and they can do what's referred to as a jump dispersal, where human activity can accidentally move these insects. This is why we tell you don't move the firewood. This is why we don't want you to move anything tree related outside of the area in which you and originally found it. That way we can limit the spread of these insects. This means that we're going to have to watch what we do, make changes in how we approach things. And it's going to mean that we're going to have to focus how we treat them. So that way we can be the most successful with the least amount of damage to other insects or trees. So a few methods that we can use to help control spongy moth. Banding is one of them that you can actually do at home. Um, so what you're seeing here is a picture of a banding practice. This is where someone has taken some burlap they have tied it around a tree and folded the burlap over. So what this happens here is that spongy moth caterpillars are gonna move up and down the trunk of the tree and they're gonna find harborage. They're gonna find a safe place underneath that folded burlap, either hiding from a predator or trying to stay warm. When you do that, you can then go to the burlap yourself, find all of these larvae hiding underneath it and you can destroy them yourself by just th throwing them in a bucket of soapy water. And then this image right here, taken from another Purdue publication, actually shows it really well. You're going to pick a spot about chest height, tie the burlap to the tree with some twine or something like that, and then fold it over where you tied it. And the larvae are going to crawl up under there and hide underneath it. Now, another method that we're going to use to try to control these is something called mating disruption. So the moths communicate to each other through a chemical known as a pheromone. And for those of you who don't know, pheromone is a chemical message sent from one organism to another. In this case, female moths are releasing a pheromone that the males detect with those big feathery antenna. And that message says, I'm right here, come and find me, I want to mate. Mating disruption uses a synthetic version of that pheromone to flood an area with that smell. So no matter where a male goes, all he can smell is a female wanting to mate, which makes it impossible or nearly impossible for him to find an actual female. He's completely blinded. This can reduce the fecundity or the reproductive capacity of that insect significantly. This is actually a process that's used right now in food distribution center and other places for moths like Indian meal moth. And it's had a lot of success in managing spongy moth. Now, this is not something that you may necessarily do on your own at your own residence, though it is, there are some products you can look at for it, but you will see this being done on a larger scale by agencies like the Indiana Department of Natural Resources to try to control these insects. Now, chemical treatments, there's really one big chemical treatment, though there is more than one, but the biggest one right now is mainly the application of an insecticide known as BT. BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, 
And what this is, is a type of protein that's been extracted from a bacteria. The protein is very specific to insects. If you aren't an insect, you lack the biochemical machinery to be affected by BT. On top of that, it's actually very, very particular. It really only affects butterflies and moths very effectively. It can have some other activity on other insects, but generally it's really low and it takes pretty specific uh, genetics to be able to do it. It's actually kind of challenging to make BT work on something other than a moth or a butterfly. Um, the great thing is, is that spongy moth is weak or sensitive to BT and you can spray it overhead. You can also buy it and spray it onto your trees. Um, the only challenge is if you try to apply it yourself, you have to spray high enough to be able to reach all the insects in the tree, which on a very old oak tree, for example, I have one in my backyard that's probably 30 feet or higher. Um, and that can be a real serious challenge to spray high enough and expect to get efficacy out of it. The other good thing about this is that we ask the question, are pollinators going to be at risk? We're using an insecticide. Well, here's the thing, our risk is fairly low. In a lot of the areas where this moth is going to occur, there may not actually be many pollinators. They're going after trees, either in urban areas or in forests. So if we use mating disruption, mating disruption is extraordinarily specific it will not affect another species. They don't use the same pheromones to communicate. And when the mating disruption chemical breaks down, it's effectively inert. It won't do anything. Um, BT, or in the case of what we use for spongy moth, BTK, which is a particular set of genetics for that protein, um, it requires the larva to consume the leaf material it's been applied to. And when you think about it, how many pollinators are going to be among certain trees? Granted, the possibility exists, but you're looking at an area where low pollination is going to be occurring. And if they're not being present at the same time, let's face it, a pollinator is going after a flower uh, and these insects are going after leaves, we're looking at two different situations. So in this case, our pollination risk is low. And people who are applying this are specifically trained to make sure that we're not applying it in such a way that's going to add to that risk. So don't worry too much about pollinators, but right now we need to protect our trees. So moving on a little bit, we wanna know where do we go from here? Well, this is a map that was put out by the DNR and it shows the counties that are currently infested with spongy moth. And you can see these are very, very uh, Northern counties they're hopefully going to stay fairly restricted to those areas. Um, and what we are doing right now is we are putting together Purdue University and the Indiana DNR working together to enact a suppression program, similar to what's happening in other states like Ohio. Obviously, like I said, we can't eradicate it. So what we're going to do is we're gonna focus on trying to prevent this insect from moving out of those counties as much as we can. You can actually go to the website of the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and they will show you their proposed treatment areas for 2023 under this suppression plan. You can actually see that, for example, in LaPorte County, we've got an insecticidal treatment of BTK and then they're showing also in Stark, Kosciuszko, Fulton, et cetera, those counties, they're going to be doing mating disruption. See, and they even list the product name for you. So Splat GMO or Splat GM Organic is a mating disruption. It's a synthetic mating disruption chemical. So they're being very, very transparent with what's going to be going on. You can also see a map of their proposed treatment areas as well. So here, what we're looking at is a map where those, the small red box indicates an insecticidal treatment, probably some BTK is going to be applied. Whereas in the larger blue areas, we're looking at splat GMO being applied. So these are also going to be open to public comment too. And the DNR has listed the dates that public comment will be available. So this is great. We have an extremely transparent process where you yourself are actually able to look at this and see what's going on and hear from the experts. So the big question now is what can we do to help? So you've actually started, you listened to this, you learned how to identify spongy moth, and you have an understanding of the kinds of trees that it's going to attack. So that means that you've now learned a little bit on the biology of this insect, you understand how its life cycle works. 
You can help promote tree health through good management practices and extension offices across the state will work with you to help educate you on that and provide you tools you need to be able to understand what to do. Please don't move wood products and tell all your neighbors, tell all your friends, don't move firewood. If you use a tree product that you're getting directly out of the woods, don't take it from beyond that spot. Not only will that stop the spread of spongy moth, it will also help control the spread of other potential invasive insects. And report if you suspect you've seen a moth. You, it doesn't even need to be something you guarantee. It's just if you suspect it, report it, and you can report it using these resources. So we have reportinvasive.com, which is a website that we run. And you can also call 1-866-NO-EXOTIC or 1-866-663-663. 9684. You can also go to a few different websites, www.edmaps.org and www.gledden.org are two uh, locations where you can report invasive species. And you can just email me at rfbruner at purdue.edu. We are here to help. We are here to listen to you. And we need your help in stopping the spread of these invasives. So with that, I want to thank you for your time, and please feel free to put any comments or questions that you have in the comments below this video. Thank you very much.